So Matthew Alfred is going to give us a perspective on um, winds and currents and I think near inertial oscillations, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll let you go ahead. Okay, that sounds good. Let's just get people this. will be coming in for a moment yeah. or two. So. Let's get the sharing set up here. Okay. Looks good. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. So good morning. And you know, I promised Sarah I would I would do this talk. Um, this is actually a talk I gave at Scripps on January 6th, 2021. Um, so it wasn't very well attended <laughs> for obvious reasons. And um I, I think there's some I, things here that that are not quite uh, within the scope of, of you know this very surface oriented project, but I, I do think there are there might be some some thoughts here so that are relevant. I, I've been thinking about um, you know the energy or the power really that goes into near inertial waves for a long time. Um, this is actually a snap a, a movie from a, a simulation that Harper Simmons uh, did, and he and I wrote up in 2012. I think it's quite beautiful. You can really see this is a you know a cycling loop from February 1995 where he's just forcing it with with winds, and you see the mid latitude storms come through, and then they force these 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 beautiful near inertial oscillations. Which then uh, this is what we're contouring here is the velocity at the surface. So this is exactly what you're trying to measure, and um, then of course this is then a 3D internal wave projection problem where um, we'd really like to know the horizontal and the vertical extent of the waves that get generated. So if people want to follow up a little bit more, um, what I've been doing a long time for a long time is these, these simple slab models where you basically take a wind product, you um, pretend the mixed layer is a slab, the equations get very simple, you compute uh, tau.u and you've got the wind work. And so what I did, uh, Tom Farrar actually is on this call. He, he and Al Pluteman wrote a nice paper in 2006 um, sharply criticizing that uh, approach because it doesn't handle the, the mixed layer deepening correctly. And so, um, so I kind of went back uh, and, and looked at that in a little bit more detail in this first paper in 2020. And then a second one too, and you know, I put this last because if we don't get to it, it won't be the end of the world, but there's also an effort um, that's useful for, for modeling about how to how much of the energy stays within sort of a vertical column in the local near field of the generation versus goes far away. And I see Seth Zipples on too. Um, there's actually a very nice uh, uh, energetic based treatment of this um, where they're actually resolving a few more terms than I was able to in this simple analysis. So I recommend both of those efforts. So by way of motivation, um, this is a, a mooring that I had out in, in 2012 out at Station Papa. And what I'm plotting here, um, <clears throat> it's a two year long record. So the upper panel is just a Hobmuller of unscaled uh, kinetic energy using a bandpass filter to, to isolate the near inertial part. And then the bottom one is just WKB scaled. So you remove the natural effect of the ocean to, to refract the waves and reduce their amplitude at depth due to the lower stratification. So if you look at this, this is sort of a, the most apples to apples depth comparison. You can see that there's obviously, and then I, I put the mixed layer on here too. So in the fall, you can see that the mixed layer uh, steadily deepens. This is at 50 North in the North Pacific, horrendous storms all the time, very weak mesoscale eddy field though. And you can see that over time, you get these, um, these intermittent bursts of uh, near inertial energy in the mixed layer. And then, and then, via a combination of linear and actually nonlinear physics um, that projects onto waves that then can propagate down into the ocean interior. And this has been a big focus of mine. And the re one of the reasons is that there's the energy that goes into these near inertial waves is, is sort of enough, it's a large enough fraction of a terawatt to, um, to have people who are thinking about maintaining the abyssal stratification of the ocean uh, care about that. And, and in order for them to be relevant, they have to propagate down into the thermocline. So that's example one. Um, you can see there's a strong seasonal cycle to it. Um, in the summertime, the mixed layers are very shallow. There's very, very weak uh, near inertial kinetic energy in the interior. And then I think the, the other message is that these, these um, you, you, you do see these episodic events in the, in the mixed layer, which, which is, is this project's focus. 
you, if I were to zoom in, now this is a different location. This is near Cape Mendocino off of California here. And this is a mooring that I had, um, again, you know, 12 years ago or so. What, what you can see in this upper panel is I'm plotting about a thousand meters in the vertical, but a much shorter amount of time here. Now this is just six days. And so you can see the isopycnals are kind of going up and down because there's a strong internal tide. But what I'm contouring in color is the shear. And it turns out you can just move into an isopycnal following coordinate to remove that tidal heaving. And once you do that, you see the, the phase lines straighten up quite nicely. And you see this is clearly a downward propagating near inertial wave. Of course, for internal waves, you see phase going up and you know the energy must be going down. And just the, the only point of this is that once they do make it into the deep sea, um, these contours are actually Richardson number equals one. So the shear is getting pretty, pretty close to unstable and they can be relevant for mixing of the deep sea. I'll skip this next panel, but this is another paper where we did a big climatology of the, the kinetic energy as a function of, uh, of everywhere in the, in the globe from historical records. Okay, and I think you guys are going to have to, I, I know Sarah wants me to keep this to 30 minutes, so I'm going to really try to try to pick up the pace here. Um, so this is kind of a schematic that Harper and I had, and we actually used this to, um, to get the Niskin experiment that ONR is just finishing up right now on near inertial gen generation, near, near, near inertial wave generation near Iceland. But what we think of is this is kind of the, the basically the problem I'm trying to solve in this talk is 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 um for starters I want to see how big a mistake we made in the old days when we used the slab model to compute the, the wind work and the kind of like the bottom line up front version there is that is that Tom and Al really got it right in 2006 in that the slab mo models can over predict the wind work but it turns out that that because of this interesting, uh, nice scaling for the mixed layer depth um, that I'll show in a little bit, this is 1970s mixed layer theory. It turns out that when the mixed layers are already deep, that actually doesn't make a big difference. So this, this effect is mostly when you have very shallow mixed layers. And so globally, the, the, over, the overestimate is about 20% or so. So it was, it, was, it was an overestimate, but not a horrendous one. And then the second part, um, which again, we might not get to is that once that wind work you know, kind of gets to work on a column of water, <clears throat> then some of that energy is going to stay local in the high modes, and some of it's going to radiate away in the low modes. And we'd like to know this fraction Q over which that happens. And then finally, and in fact, this is the point that Tom and Al were making, is that the, the wind actually has to, the, the waves actually have to pay us a tax. Um, they don't get to use all of the wind work uh, to make linear propagating waves in the interior because we can measure that there's been a potential increase when the mixed layer deepens. And so we try to quantify that in this talk, but again, there's a lot of uncertainties. Okay, so this is way too much text, but um, this, is, this, is, this is in essence what I, what I just said in the previous slide. Okay, so if we take kind of a simple, a simple slab model, um, what are we doing, right? And um, we're, we're simply writing down the linearized equations. And then, um, so the time dependence is where you get the near inertial response, it's strongly resonant. You're forcing it with the wind. And then simply you're, you're, you're actually parameterizing the, the um, all friction as, as just a simple Rayleigh drag here. And then the way that you, so, so there's no horizontal dependence in this problem. And so there's no way to get any any convergences and divergences that could pump motions in the mixed layer. But if, if, you're, if the response varies over time, then you do have these convergences and they can pump waves going down into the interior. So just looking at a little bit of the theory, and again, we're not gonna get into this in a great gory amount of detail. I have to move all these faces here so that I can see my equations. Um, now what we're doing is we're shifting into a complex notation here where this is the, the, the complex uh, current U plus IV here. And then, uh, and then, th then, then these, these, dra these, these friction terms or, or uh, stress terms, this is the wind stress, and then this is the, the sort of uh, turbulent stress at the base of the mixed layer. So in the slab model, we parameters that with, with, with Rayleigh drag, this simple um, you know, linearly proportional to the current. And then what we're gonna to try to do in this talk is see if we can actually improve on that through, again, very, very ancient mixed layer theory from um, Pollard, Rines, and Thompson, and also Price, Weller, Pinkel, 
we can just simply replace that with a Richardson number closure with the turbulence, which at least is going to attempt to get uh, some of the some of the energetics correct for these deepening mix layers. Okay, so and and then and then here's here's the essence. Now we're trying to cover you know 50 years worth of mixed layer theory in one slide here. But the idea is that if I now I have to move the faces back to the other side. So um, the idea is that if I if I begin with the mixed layer here and blow a wind on it, then I'm eventually going to get uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm eventually going to get that 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 the turbulence and training fluid in the in the interior, and we can quantify the increase. Of, of that mixed layer. Now, now if I if it, if there's no rotation, that process will will proceed for a long time. Um, but it turns out, if you can sort of think of it intuitively, that that after a half an inertial period, the mixed layer is now facing the opposite direction of the wind, and I'm no longer able to do any work. And so, so so you have this asymptote of of the mixed layer depth. Um, that actually scales here, and importantly, the old scalings had n squared in the denominator, and now there's a there's an nf, and so that's the important thing. And so, so what, so so this is the essence of this whole talk, really, is that is that you kind of expect this this sort of plateauing of the mixed layer depth, um, and 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 that 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 mixed layer depth where that happens scales as uh, as the the friction velocity divided by divided by nf. So. When we look at that, we can then uh, one more slide of theory before we get into the results is that we can then simply do the usual things of multiplying by the velocity to get an energy equation. And then when we do that, again, I'm glossing over some details here, skip this term. What we find out then is that the energy going into the inertial kinetic energy is equal to, is, is, is increased by wind work at the surface. And then this can actually be positive or negative, um, but usually it's usually it's negative. And so this then is what we're trying to parameterize in terms of loss uh, or or gain in potential energy at the mixed layer base. And then just putting this into cartoon form, this is going back to Crawford and Large, uh, 1996 here, where now you can say, okay, well we have this this uh, this wind work which goes into this bucket of the inertial kinetic energy. And then through turbulent production, which we're saying is equal to this, this, this stress at the base of the mix layer, we then get turbulent kinetic energy. And in fact, that has to pay a tax to this potential energy if the mix layer deepens. And that's what we're trying to quantify here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is take this really, really simple approach in this paper. Okay, so at every, at every location on the globe, I will take the simple slab model and I'll run that. And then instead, as an improvement on that, I'll take the, the price boiler pinkle model, which is basically an implementation of those physics we just discussed, where now you've got the ability to, to, do, to deepen the mixed layer. And then it's trivial to, to then take the before and after uh, density profiles, quantify the increase in potential energy, and then we can, we can get a little bit quantitative about these things. Okay, so here's an example. And um, let's see. Each of these panels, what I'm trying to show here is the, this difference, this dependence on this H star or this uh, kind of um, limiting mixed layer depth. So what you can see here on the left is first, I've just got the wind stress. Now these are idealized cases where I just simply put in a half inertial period of a, of a rotating wind. So it's, it's a resonant wind for half a, half a period. And here I've got for a shallow mixed layer on the left, on the depth on the left, a deep mixed layer on the right, We've got wind stress, temperature, which basically just shows you the mixed layer depth. We've got the inertial currents, and then the red, in this case, the, the 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 slab model calculation is in blue, and then the PWP calculation is in red. We've got the wind work, which is tau dot u, and then we've got the integral, the time integral. Okay. So what you find in this left-hand side is that um, it's exactly as um, Pluteman and Farrar predicted, predicted. So you've got a pretty shallow mix layer, which because of this, um, because it's strongly forced is rapidly deepening. The model can't handle that and has no ability, to, the slab model can't handle that. It has no ability to put any energy anywhere else besides inertial kinetic, kinetic energy. And so you get a large response. Whereas PWP actually does something 
and it actually then takes that energy away. And so you get uh, a smaller answer. And so this is basically the point that uh, Flitterman and Ferrar were making. And then what you find is that if you repeat the calculation for a deep mixed layer, then basically the mixed layer doesn't deepen very much. This effect is much weakened and the response is basically the same in the two cases. Okay, so we can quantify that a little bit. Now we're, now we're gonna try to actually look at this dependence on the mixed layer depth as a function of this, 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 this star here, um, U star over root NF. And so what we found is that, that I ran that same case there um, that I just showed. Um, I forget which one I ran for that particular case, but it doesn't matter. Um, well, I ran both both of them. So we're going to look at that as a function. And you can see that this, this is true, that for very shallow mixed layers, you start to get these very, very large overestimates of the slab model. And then once you're on the other side of this H star line here, then you do better. And you can just put that in terms of the ratio and it, and it, and it shows the, the expected effect. Now we can turn that a little bit more into energetics because PWP, as I said, is, is it's still a very simple turbulence closure, but it is, it is doing something. And so, so what you find then is in this case is that <clears throat> as you, um, so to, to focus on this, this, this center one here. So for shallow mixed layers over here on the left, we find that, um, that, there's, that there's this percentage of the wind going into um, going into the of the wind work going into inertial motions and then as the the, the mixed layer gets deeper and deeper that 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 uh, that gets that gets greater which makes sense okay so that was just an idealized case so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the Mara two winds as kind of an introduction to this global calculation and just see if these 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 basically hold up and and you can essentially see that 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 it is that it's a it's there's more complexity of course because the winds it's not always resonant etc. But when you start with a shallow mixed layer, you can see that the blue and the red lines differ, and when you start with a deep mixed layer, they they're very similar. Okay, so then you can go and you can do this over the globe, and and you find out. Um, for starters, it's kind of interesting that this is actually a global PDF of that ratio of the mixed layer depth to uh, this H star parameter, the limiting mixed layer depth. And you find that actually a lot of the ocean is fairly close to, to that. And so what that means is that, as I said before, when you have those cases where the mixed layer is very deep compared to that parameter, the slab model agrees perfectly with the PWP model. And then as you move to these more common uh, and, and lower values, you start to find this overestimation. So you can do these global totals. And this is the point um, that I was making here that globally, you know, you, you, can, you can do these calculations and you wind up with this sort of 20% overestimate. So I think the message here is that, you know, it's so easy to run PWP instead of a slab that really we should just do that um, instead, of, instead of that if we're interested in the wind work. But, you know, I was also interested in, I mean, the other crucial thing for, and again, maybe this is where, where this talk sort of differs in its focus from what you guys might care about, but, but I've always been really fascinated by, you know, what's, where's the energy for these deep breaking near inertial waves coming from? And so I'm always interested in, in um, how much energy is available to propagate to those depths. And so, so I can go, now I have this, this, this model framework, I can go in and I can actually try a couple of different ways for, for estimating this, this key ratio here, which is on the right, okay? So, so maybe I'll just walk through this really quickly. Um, I'm not doing too bad on time. So basically, um, so the top panels are, are the month of March, the bottom panels are the month of September, and then these are latitude plots. So what we can see here is that, you know, um, the true mixed layer depth here is, um, so that, so again, H star is just a function of N and F and the, and the, the, the basically the forcing the wind stress. And so this is what it is. Um, the observed mixed layer depths, as we all know, in the Northern hemisphere in, in winter get very, very deep. And so they greatly exceed this H star. So as a result, you know, all the things that I said earlier are true between the slab and the PWP model. But importantly here, what you find is now we can, we can compute the wind work. And then I have these two estimates here that I'm not gonna go into the differences, but these are two different ways that we can kind of imperfectly estimate how much is going into the inertial kinetic energy. 
And one of these is a function of, of how resonant this is a, a result from Crawford and Large, the forcing is. And then the other one is actually attempting, again, using a fairly crappy turbulence closure model, attempting to actually estimate you know, the, the turbulent production and subtract that. So the point here is that um, in this particular case, you got something like half of the energy uh, in this in this the, the, in the, the latter case going into inertial kinetic energy, and if you're if you're taking this resonance parameter, which I think is a lower bound for a variety of reasons, but you get actually that that a much smaller sort of like a quarter of the of the wind work is going into inertial waves. Okay, so just take a step back. What does this actually mean? What that means in in sort of a nutshell is that when you get Yahoo's like you know Alford saying here's the wind work this is relevant to deep ocean mixing, um, you really do need to actually multiply it by some, as yet I would say, fairly unconstrained fr uh, fraction. And it's something like a half, let's just say. And that's the energy that it's available to, to mix the, the deep sea. And the rest is actually what went in to deepening the mix layer. This is even maybe getting a little bit further afield from um, from from near from inertial currents at the at the surface, but I, I still think it's so cool. I'm going to show it really really quickly. Um, I just think the Argo program is is this is this thing that we've we just keep on discovering these 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 bizarrely useful ways to look at the data um, that would not have been anticipated. So so what I'm looking at here is again. So this is a potential energy view um, in these calculations. We can we can actually simply quantify how much potential and i haven't seen this really done much but you know but so 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 basically on the on the left here what i'm doing is i'm plotting the potential energy that actually um that, that where the the pwp simulations show so in june not much happens in october here's the wind tracks and you see that there's a lot of potential energy increase in as the storms are deepening uh the mix layer but what we can do using argo is we can actually simply so there's there's um there's there's these monthly climatologies of mixed layer depth computed from Argo. You can simply take that and you can just difference month to month, and you can, can you can come up with a time series and a spatial map of the increase in potential energy due to the mixed layer deepening. And you see these huge signals now. This is you know this is now southern winter. So up here you see this, and and then you can actually compare them. And what's more, you can actually take then you can actually take a heat flux product um from era interim or what or, or your favorite one and you can compute how much actually you'd expect the mixed layer to deepen due to um due to buoyancy loss at the surface and you can get quantitative about these things but the point that actually amazed me is that there's actually a constraint in here um if you believe these climatologies um now i'm just plotting latitude latitude means here and so the so so just just taking one of these if you if you believe this climatology which is the yellow line and then you believe this is not model or anything this is actually the um the the observed mix layer increase from the argo profiles they're actually pretty darn close to each other and what that actually means and what i've actually done is i've multiplied it by the the correct sort of entrainment coefficient that anise and moon came up with so this is basically an Argo-based sort of global confirmation that that entrainment coefficient of 0 0.17 was approximately correct. Okay, and then I think, yeah, easy. So five minutes for this, just um, just touching on this local and remote approach. Um, so, so just, this is another sort of set of pandemic thoughts that I had. These papers were both written early 2020, um, and I was lucky because I didn't have small kids. Um, so I was able to do some thinking, but, um, there's an approach that's used in the internal tide mixing community where if you if you know something about the conversion um, as a function at the surface or at the bottom in the case of the internal tides basically the work being done on a column of water then you can as ascribe some sort of arbitrary depth function to it and then a local fraction q saying everything else goes away to other places on the globe and then you can actually parameterize the mixing as a function or the dissipation rate as a function of, 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 of X, Y, and Z using that simple parameterization. So anyway, we did the same thing um, 
Marcus Joachim and I did, and a bunch of others did the same thing where we were trying to say, okay, well, does this matter for near inertial waves in climate models? And it turned out it did, but we weren't very happy because we just did the same thing the internal tide people did. And we just said, this is a 0 0.3, it's a global constant. So it turns out with near inertial waves, it's actually very simple to just follow Gill 1984's formalism. And what Gill does, it's actually, it's a real beautiful paper if people haven't read it. Basically, if you have a mixed layer, if you have a slab model um, that's, that's excited uh, a, mix, a near inertial velocity in a mixed layer, you can simply do a modal projection, projection onto these modes, which are, these are the, the eigen, eigen solutions to, to the equations. And then you can then simply project um, to get the amount, the amount of energy that goes into each of those modes. And this is old stuff. This was done back in ocean storms by Eric Desaro, et cetera. But what's really easy to do in this context is now, if you actually have a climatologies of all you need is N, you know, the, the stratification, the mixed layer depth, the, the bottom depth and the mixed layer depth, and then you can just turn the crank and come up with these things. So now this is just an example where um, for an example in the Pacific and then the Atlantic and then the global mean, this is now the partition of the flux as a function of mode number. And I just solved it for the first 20, 20 modes. And then what we do in this silly calculation is we actually then say, okay, if it's, if it's modes zero through four or one through four, sorry, then it's, then it's gonna, it's gonna propagate far away because the, the phase speeds are fast and the scales are long, so they don't lose much energy. And then everything else will kind of just burn away and uh, dissipate locally. And so then this is, the, this is the maps that we get of the energy into these different modes. And then finally, what you can do then is you can say, okay, this is now in this wintertime and the summertime, this is the actual ratio of the modes in five and higher, which are gonna, which we're gonna say stay local to, to the rest. And so, so there's a little bit of you know geography to it, but really, I mean, the essence of this calculation is that it's not 0 0.3, it's 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 kind of 0 0.65 or something like that. And and I think the point for you know, for for climate models, is you can easily you can easily run this offline and and come up with a better a better estimate of Q. Okay, um, I think that is basically everything I wanted to say. So, um, take questions and discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. This is great. Questions for Matthew. Well. Maybe while people are thinking, I'll start by asking the sort of the, the big question that we'll have. Um, if we're thinking about a satellite on a sun synchronous orbit with measurements every day or so, is that sampling enough? What matters for the types of processes you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of why I wasn't, I didn't feel so guilty showing this talk which was otherwise mostly unrelated is I, as I do think, um, I do think it's capturing these, these, these sorts of periods, right. Um, mm -hmm. when the phase is changing rapidly, that's going to be a challenge. Um, and I actually, I, I, when you guys were started this seminar series, I, I believe I saw a couple of, um, talks showing that people are working on this and, and, and able to make some good progress. And so I'm yeah. probably not up on the latest and greatest, but, um, I do think you know you can imagine sampling this once a day would be a pretty pretty intense um, sampling problem. Yeah, and this is going to come back to trusting slab models or something else to yeah, clean yeah. up the signal. Right, right, right. Or deciding that you didn't need to know it, but you um, you understand enough from the dynamics just by having been statistics. Right. Other questions? Hey, Mara. Mara has her hand hey. Yeah, so I had a question, um, and maybe I just didn't understand this and you said it, but from your Argo analysis, um, is there, are you able to partition how much of the mixed layer deepening is coming from like, surface buoyancy person versus wind input? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Yeah, sorry, I went really fast through that. Um, 
and this is all in that that first paper. But but yeah, this this allows us to do that. And again, it's it's modulo. So so this top panel is is basically an estimate of the wind forced mixed layer deepening from, and it's it's from you know PWP, so it's imperfect, right? Whereas this is just everything that happened, and then this is the buoyancy part, right? And so if we look at at some of these, um, so, so if we look at these, these kind of tell you the answer is that in a lot of the ocean, and I think this is conventional wisdom, is that in a lot of the ocean, the fall patterns of mixed layer deepening are set by, by, by buoyancy forcing. So here you see in the Southern Ocean, or sorry, in the, in the Northern Hemisphere in December, this is, this is the buoyancy term and this is the total term and that the wind term is much weaker, right? But on the other hand, at these at certain locations in the in mid latitudes where you have this strong storm forcing, they are comparable, right? So, um, so I think there's some nuance there too. It's a great question. Okay, thank you. Matthew, can I ask about PWP versus the all the other large family of one layer models that people use. Yeah, yeah. You know, actually, um, it's too bad Leah Johnson's not here because she's just. I'm not sure if she's published it yet. Maybe somebody else knows, but I know that she, during her postdoc with Baylor, was actually working on exactly that, racing a lot of these 1D um, mixed layer turbulence models against each other. And um, so she was. She was actually one of the reviewers of this paper. So she let me off the hook. Uh, she wasn't too horrified by my use of PWP. Um, but, uh, there probably are, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's better ones, but yeah, keep an eye out for Leah's paper. I think that, that, that that's right. That's going to answer that question. Exactly. So, and I guess Gotham has a whole family built into it. Right. But right. it's, um, yeah, less trivial to implement. Yeah. I mean, buried in this um, this kind of uncertainty about, I mean, we can go all the way back to these equations here. Um, um, you know, buried in this is this is this uncertainty about the so-called mixing efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mostly, you know, mixing efficiency is this is this kind of annoying quantity in the ocean where we um, we, we we measure. We usually, you know, we microstructure people measure dissipation rate. And what we really want is buoyancy flux, so we're stuck with with uh, guessing at this mixing efficiency. And mostly that's true, but I think there there are situations where it's actually of fundamental interest, and I think this is one of them. And what I mean by that is here we actually have an energetic framework, right? We know how much wind work there is there is, and so therefore it's not just operational; it's actually fundamentally important what how efficient the the, the mixing at the base of the mix layer is, and this is one of those situations that it's kind of hard to get the mixing efficiency right because, you know, you imagine this is this is a this is a turbulent mix layer that is ninety percent mostly unstratified, but it's also grinding away, you know, strongly at this strongly stratified stratified region at the base of it, and so what you're being asked to do is come up with kind of a bulk mixing efficiency for that whole project, that whole process, and that's actually hard for these models to get right, so. Um, yeah. In that regard, do you think the mixing at the base of the mixed layer follows the same scalings as the mixing everywhere else, or is yeah, that I a mean, very special region? Yeah, it's very it's very special, um, and you know certainly the convective part of it is 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 just simply qualitatively different than the shear driven part. Mm -hmm. But you know this this wind driven part is you know it's it's shear instabilities. Um, Alexis Kaminsky has actually been working on this problem really mm -hmm. well. She 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 finds these little scouring instabilities and things like that. Um, I I think of it as one of the regions where you know at least at the mixed layer base it's it's quite likely that this is just completely generic shear driven turbulence. Um, but um, I, I I'm wrong all the time. So, and other people should um, speak up if they have questions, but I wanted to ask about um, Stokes drift and surface waves and whether that has an effect that 
ideally should be taken into account or whether it can be neglected? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, this is obviously completely absent from from this entire talk. Um, and I, I guess I would defer to Seth and Tom about what their opinions are on this topic. But my my take is that, um, you know, we know there are, we can certainly find examples, um, you know, parameter ranges, like Jerry Smith showed in 1990, where Langer turbulence is actually appreciably deepening the mixed layer a lot more than 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 these processes. Um, globally, I don't actually have any idea how important that is. And maybe the other issue is that some of the wind energy that we measure is going into driving Stokes drift or surface waves and not other processes. But I see it, other people have. Yeah, although I will say that this is a very near inertial filtered world of the equations. Mm -hmm. And so so this this wind work is intend is intended to be um, tau dot u inertial, right? So mm -hmm. there would be a separate bucket of energy that's forcing the linear motions. I see that Tom and Seth have both turned on their video. <laughs> I'm sure Seth uh, has something better, smarter to say than I do. So Seth, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that I'm sure Tom has something smarter to say than I do. So, but um, yeah, I don't know that it's, it's an interesting question that the, the the thing that's frustrating when you go through these equations it matters how you average and when you integrate and you get different sets of equations based on when you do those things and they i'm still i don't know tom and i have talked about this there i think there are waves where there, there's some terms that can change energy between different scales but i don't know how important they are and when they show up so it's a little unclear to me I, I think it's probably mostly probably fine to do the near inertial filter, but it just depends how you look at it sometimes and, and how you set up the, the equation set, which is sometimes confusing even when you go back and look through the literature and see how other folks have done it. But there is, you know, the the surface forcing, there's a tau dot u stokes that should show up as well if you pose the equations and sort of the, the stokes uh framework and in theory there's you know if you have this equation here pm equals epsilon plus jb there's a stokes shear production at that depth as well that might change your mixing and and so there's a whole bunch of ways where it could come in but it's i mean i i agree it seems like models often do better with getting mixed layer depths right if they include some langmuir but it's i think the grand scheme it's at least with our measurements, with the dissipation measurements, the Stokes shear component was sort of smaller than the noise in our mixed layer epsilon estimate. So it was a little hard to see if it was that important or not, but they were somewhat noisy estimates of epsilon. So it's, I I guess it's um, still kind of an open question, which isn't, I'm not sure I've added much to the conversation there, but um, it's kind of what I was going to say. It's all hand it back to Tom. Yeah, no, it's good to hear that come out of your mouth because I, I know that you, you guys thought about these these equations very carefully in your in your recent GRL paper. So the fact that there's still confusion allowed is is uh, <laughs> is good to hear, right? Yeah. Oh it's not I don't know if it's good to hear, but it's it's information. Can I yeah, just say, I mean, yeah. go when ahead. Thinking, when we're thinking about planning big projects, it's good to have open questions. <laughs> and identifying where there are controversies and unknowns is always helpful, especially if we can address them by making more measurements. Yeah, I mean, people have been talk talking about this kind of murky region called the transition layer, you know, mm -hmm. for decades, and and I, I I still have come away with the impression that 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 there's there's work to do there. So I don't know if Tom and uh, Seth feel the same. Sounds like they do. Um, my big concern about wind work just doing a straightforward computation of wind work from Odyssey is that uh, there will be like this pretty large downwind velocity near the surface. Uh, and so I just 
have a fear at Tau.U you will be huge, but mostly what we'll be seeing is turbulence in the upper meter, or, you know, we'll see wind work that generates tons of turbulence in the upper meter and that that will be the, the bulk of it. But I like Matthew's observation that, uh, if you can kind of filter for the inertial dynamics by isolating the near inertial signal, you still have a sensible way to talk about this. Uh, so if we, with Odyssey, we're faced with this challenge to, uh, you know, we have this kind of large near inertial oscillation signal that we have to separately estimate uh, and so maybe it's kind of an opportunity. Uh, we can isolate the near inertial signal and look at the energy budget of the near inertial waves. Yeah, I, I, I think so. But I, I also think, you know, caveated by what Seth said is that 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 that's that's one of the keys, right? Is that there is the slab model doesn't allow shear, but we know there's shear. And that's clearly a source of some of the turbulence in the mix layer. And, and I, I do sometimes worry that this seemingly clean decomposition into the near inertial has sneaky little cross terms that, that aren't quite accounted for. So, so I, I, I completely agree. Yes, I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I don't know if this is just sort of musing or something, but it, it does seem like the just sort of the some of the open questions are these, you know, what transfers energy to different frequency scales and how is that related to some of the the shear and and the upper ocean? And um, I think it's you know what Tom said. You do get a lot of shear near the surface at short time scales potentially with these storms, and and that maybe is to the earlier question where some of the wave forcing comes in. But it's yeah, I think these are still some of the, the open question parts of this problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because we were sitting here talking and, and somebody brought this up, I, I thought I'd mention this one just because one of my students, Alex Andriatis, is working with Luke Linane and some modelers at Johns Hopkins um, to, 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 to try to get our mind around, you know, the deep thing due to these, these Langmuir cells. So these are just some, some observations we had of a really densely instrumented thermistor chain. This is uh, Alex putting them over the side. <laughs> um, and what we tried to do is kind of an Alexis Kaminsky and Eric Tassaro sort of thing here with really, really upping the, the resolution near where we thought the mixed layer would be deepening. But when you really, you know, so, so, so if you zoom in on a tiny, it just looks like it's all mixed here, but if you zoom in on a tiny piece here, you can, and then, and then zoom way in on your temperature contours, you can really see these, these very, very clear um, coherent structures in the mixed layer that, um, that are nice. This was, this was a really, really strongly forced, you know, it's sort of blowing 35 knots right now. There's 17 foot waves, et cetera. Um, but you can see these structures are, are, so Alex is actually trying, and there's, so there's strong conductive heat loss and also probably strongly um, strong Stokes drift. And so we're trying to sort out which, which is which. But I just thought I'd throw this up as kind of a concrete example of, of some of the complexity of, how, I guess it's a good it's maybe it's a good way to end this talk is how much complexity you, you simply have to throw out um, under the rug or sweep under the rug when you talk about just the near inertial part. Because yeah, this 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 whole panel is an hour and a half here, right? So there's, there's a lot of structure. Yeah, I'm just daunted by what we cannot measure from space. Right, right. Maybe I shouldn't have ended on such a depressing note. Good to have challenges. So, well, if there's if there are no further comments or questions, then we can thank Matthew for a really great discussion and um, 
see everybody next week. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. And um, feel free to reach out if you have any more things you want to ask about. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for inviting me. Yeah, this was great. Really appreciate it. Great. Have a good one, everyone.